thank you everybody for joining us for our Design Inno Innovation Month webcast. My name is Chris Dubuque. I'm located out in the Portland, Oregon office, one of the application engineers with Computer Aided Technology. I'm just going to be sitting back and, and helping out with today's webcast. I'd like to introduce Bill Roos, Simulation Product Specialist, and he's going to take us through his linear dynamic presentation. Thank you, Bill. Thanks, Chris. Appreciate the introduction there. Uh, so as Chris said, my name is Bill Roos, and uh, welcome everyone. I'm glad you could join us for today's Design Innovation Month session. I'm on the CATI East team, and I'm located in our Louisville, Kentucky office. So the statement you may be reading on screen is a description of today's Design Innovation Month session, and we're focusing on SOLIDWORKS simulation and specifically dynamic analysis. So just a quick product review. There are several finite element analysis software solutions available from SOLIDWORKS. Today I'm going to show you the capabilities in SOLIDWORKS Simulation Premium for solving time-based loading conditions or dynamic analysis. So I could really talk about any one of these dynamic analysis types for much longer than 20 minutes. So today what I'm going to do is really hit the highlights of when to use each of these four analysis types and show you things to pay attention to when setting up these type of problems. So the question of today's design innovation webinar, why dynamic analysis? Well, it, it's quite simple really. The products we design are subjected to many, many different loading conditions and they're not just static loads. And in the big scheme of things, our designs must withstand all possible loading conditions. Now, Many industries have products that experience dynamic loading, and, and I have a very short list there. That list is in no way comprehensive. It's just a couple of examples of common industries that have dynamic loading. So when I think about dynamic environments, they can really be broken down into two categories, and each category has two types. Here we have periodic loading, and the load is either repeating, well, the load is repeating, and it can either be considered a simple or a complex but repetitive load. The second category is non-periodic, and here I have two types, a single event that is easily characterized or a series of complex but non-related events. Regardless of periodic or non-periodic, we as engineers need to be able to characterize each loading condition for the type of dynamic analysis that we need to perform. So here are the four types of linear dynamic studies available in SOLIDWORKS Simulation Premium. I'll briefly explain what each of these are during the remainder of this design innovation webinar, but first, before we get into that, first, a little background information on structural analysis. As a structural analyst, everything I see can be broken down into a simple spring mass damper system. And what you see at the bottom is the equation of motion for this system. Now, anytime I want to solve a particular type of analysis, uh, for instance, linear static, there are a few assumptions I need to make in order to proceed with the analysis. With linear static, we assume acceleration and velocity are zero, or static equilibrium. We also assume that the forces acting on the structure are constant, not a function of time. This allows us to solve a very simple equation, F equals KX. Essentially, the entire system becomes a spring. Linear static analysis is a way to, um, well, actually what I should really say here is linear static analysis is always the first type of analysis I perform for any product. However, when I want to solve a dynamic problem, I can't jump straight into that. I first need to solve natural frequency or modal analysis. Um, and, and to do this, I start with uh, essentially the same equation of motion. And this time around, our assumptions are no damping effects and no applied forces. This simplified version is the equation for free vibration. The solution to this are the natural frequencies of the system, which are proportional to the square root of stiffness over mass. The output of natural frequency analysis are the natural frequencies of the system and the associated mode shapes. Now we're ready to discuss the assumptions we need to make for linear dynamic analysis. Stiffness is constant and displacements are small, the same assumptions we would make for linear static analysis. The difference is, now that the applied forces are no longer a constant, they can vary either with time or with frequency. 
Finally, the why, we solve natural frequency analysis first. SolidWorks simulation uses the solution technique, modal superposition, to solve dynamic problems. In simple terms, what modal superposition does is this. The loading conditions are applied to the structure to see how each of the individual modes respond. Then all of the responses from all of the deformed modes are combined together to generate a single response or output. And that's what happens with SOLIDWORKS simulation and dynamic studies. So that's the quick background information on dynamic studies. Now let's begin to look at each of the four dynamic study types available in SOLIDWORKS simulation premium. We're going to start with modal time history. Modal time history is an analysis type for solving short duration loading events, things like a shock or impulse or even an impact test. I have two examples of a time-based loading shown on screen, the one on the left for a short pulse, the other for a slightly longer but still dynamic load, dunking a basketball. When you set up the forces that act on your structure, they are entered in real time. Here you can see a portion of the setup for an applied force when the force is set to a time curve. When defining the time curve, you enter the actual data in two columns, real time on the left scale factor on the right. Looking at the picture on the left, we can see the magnitude of the force of 300 pounds. The numbers in the right-hand column of the right side picture is a scaling factor of that 300 pound load in real time. Now, when I solve modal time history analysis, we're actually solving the problem in real time or what's known as solving in the time domain. The output of this study type are the stress, strain, and displacement of the system at any moment in time. That's what you can see with that time history graph, uh, in this case, the Y displacement versus time for a solution that I previously solved. There is more to setting up modal time history analysis than just the loading conditions. Here we're looking at the dynamic options of the modal time history. This you would find in the study properties for your modal time history study. The three, three things that we need to pay attention to are when to start and stop the analysis and how often we solve the system. Personally, there are really only two things I'm concerned with here. The end time of the analysis is how long in real time that I want to solve the analysis for. Usually I would want the end time of the analysis to be at least three to five times longer than the loading duration. You may need a longer duration or end time for your analysis depending on your product requirements. The time increment for modal time history is incredibly important and the value we set here is not an arbitrary number. There are truly three different approaches for setting the time increment. I could get this from frequency analysis by determining the time period of the highest important modal wave for the structure. The second approach would be breaking up the system response as a fraction of the duration for the applied load. The third one is a little bit more complex of a calculation, but basically we're determining how long it takes the stress wave to propagate through the structure. So one thing to note about the time increment, smaller is generally better, but this also means more data will be generated and larger results files will be created. It's also going to take your computer longer to solve a modal time history analysis with a really, really small time increment. Of course, when we're looking at the results of modal time history analysis, quite often we need to look at results from a specific moment in time. In the plot shown on screen, this particular time step is when the maximum load is applied during the dunking of a basketball. The time step is highlighted in the blue box in the upper left corner of the plot. We could also look at the maximum response of the system across the entire time duration or the entire time span of the analysis. So here's a quick video showing what the response of the basketball, basketball goal stanchion is when I dunk a basketball. Now, this may or may not be on an eight and a half foot goal, but I'm never gonna tell. All right, so let's look at the second type of dynamic analysis, harmonics. Harmonic analysis is understanding the response of a system that is subjected to a cyclic loading. Here I'm showing that the curve is force as a function of time, which is exactly what a cyclic loading is. However, solving our spring mass damper system for this type of repetitive load in real time would be quite difficult. 
So rather than keeping the input as force versus time, we need to convert that into the frequency domain where the applied forces are a function of the frequency acting on the system. Here in these pictures, we see that variation with frequency is defined for a specific load. The left column is frequency in hertz, and the right column is again a multiplication factor for the applied load magnitude. When we solve harmonic analysis, we are solving the problem in the frequency domain. The output of this study type is stress, strain, and displacement of the system at a given operating frequency. Here are two response graphs, von Mises stress on the left and displacement in the y direction on the right as a function of frequency. These are two quick examples of output that we can generate with harmonic analysis. Just like modal time history, we need to include additional harmonic options in the study properties. The limits are, of our analysis are the lower and upper operating frequencies of our system that we are most concerned with. Note that you may have a frequency curve for loading conditions that are into tens of thousands of hertz, and our harmonic options is where we can limit the scope of the analysis. So just like setting end time and modal time history studies, using lower and upper limits in harmonic analysis helps reduce the size of the problem we are solving. Finally, when we create results from harmonic studies, we can either look at the response of the system at specific solved frequencies, or we can look at the maximum response of the system across the entire frequency range that we solve for the analysis. Quite often, we'll create plots of the system response at or near natural frequencies of the system. This should be where the highest stresses occur. The next dynamic study type to take a look at is random vibration. Random vibration is just that, random. The loading is considered non-deterministic. This means that it isn't possible to look at the prior loading history to determine future loading conditions. While it may appear that the load is repeating, it truly is not. There may be similar peaks and valleys of loads, but for random vibration, they are completely unrelated. Like harmonic analysis, trying to solve random vibration in real time would be incredibly compute intensive. Using conventional mathematics is, for all practical purposes, impossible to use in order to characterize random loading. So what we do is we recharacterize the loading as the statistical probability of a load occurring. This load is then converted into the frequency domain, much like we would do in harmonic analysis. Because the loading for random vibration is specified in terms of frequency, the problem is also solved in the frequency domain. The output of random vibration is the probability of a result at a specific loading frequency. Here I have another response graph that indicates von Mises stress as a function of frequency. This looks nearly identical to what I previously showed you for a potential output from harmonic analysis. The study properties of random vibration are, again, still very much like harmonic analysis in that we can limit the frequency range for our study. Like harmonics, we can specify both a lower and upper limit of frequencies to be included in the analysis. The setting for number of frequency points, in simple terms, is a method of limiting how much data to include in the solution. Five is the minimum number that you would really use. More is, of course, better, but this also increases the amount of data in the analysis, and it increases the time to solve your problem. For the correlation setting, I recommend just keep this at fully correlated until you know the why and how for using the other two settings available. As I mentioned earlier regarding random vibration results, when we look at any result quantity, we're looking at the probability of a result occurring. The default shown here, a maximum stress of just under 20,000 PSI, will include one standard deviation of data. This means that 68.2% of the time, the maximum stress will be 19,677 PSI or less. To get to two sigma, or two standard deviations, you double the values. 95.4% of the time, the maximum stress will be 39,354 PSI or less. Three sigma is three times the reported maximum stress and so forth. Last but not least is response spectrum. This linear dynamic study type is probably the least understood of the four types of dynamic analysis we can solve with SOLIDWORKS Simulation Premium. When properly set up, though, it is also one of the simplest dynamic analyses we can solve. The loading input 
for a response spectrum analysis is a response spectrum, kind of ironic. You can think of the loading in terms of waves or pulses of energy. Notice that the graph on the right is peak acceleration versus frequency. That's the input that we would do for a response spectrum analysis. So, how do you generate the response spectra? Well, starting with a single degree of freedom oscillator, you subject it to a variety of transient loads. Then you measure the response of that oscillator due to the loading, generating a peak acceleration curve. You repeat this process for many other single degree of freedom oscillators with different mass and stiffness properties to build the spectrum. The response spectrum is a PS PSD curve. This, like harmonics and random vibration, is forced as a function of frequency. As I mentioned earlier, a common input for response spectrum is the peak acceleration versus frequency. So a response spectrum analysis is solved in the frequency domain, like harmonics and like random vibration. The output of this analysis is the peak response of the system, not the entire time history of the solution. When we set up the study properties for response spectrum, there are four options for combining the data from the solved modes. These are usually determined by the specification you are trying to meet for your product. Now I'm going to focus on the first three of the combination methods. Square root sum of squares, or SRSS, is the one that's most commonly used. Absolute sum is going to generate a more conservative result from your analysis. And then finally, complete quadratic combination, or CQC, is an improved method of SRSS. This does a better job of combining data from your modes that are really close together. Um, side note, CQC is often used in response spectrum analysis for seismic loading conditions. Uh, and actually, uh, as you note, know, it says random vibration output. That should really say response spectrum. My apologies there. Uh, finally, the output of response spectrum is, as I mentioned, the peak response of the system from transient loading conditions. In simplest terms, it's the worst case stress and displacement that will occur due to the transient inputs that your product is going to see. So to recap, this chart should help you identify the differences between the four different linear dynamic study types that are available in SOLIDWORKS Simulation Premium. When deciding the type of dynamic analysis you need to perform, it can be as simple as looking at the loading that your product will experience. Is it an impact load? Use modal time history. A non-deterministic load? Use random vibration. When you're looking at results, you need to remember whether or not you're looking at the system response in the time domain or the frequency domain. And when you're looking at the output of the analysis, random vibration is probability of damage based on the probability of loading conditions occurring, while response spectrum is the peak response of the system due to transient loads. So again, quick reference, use that chart for the different types of dynamic analyses that you might need to solve with SOLIDWORKS simulation. So dynamic studies in SOLIDWORKS simulation is just one, one of the many analysis types that we can help you solve. SOLIDWORKS simulation is for your structural analysis needs. SOLIDWORKS flow simulation will help you with fluid dynamic problems. SOLIDWORKS motion is for rigid body kinematic and dynamic analysis. And finally, SOLIDWORKS plastics can help you improve your injection molded part designs. So be sure to contact your CATI account manager to begin discussing how we can help you with your analysis needs. They will get someone from our simulation team engaged and help you understand which of our products are the best fit for your analysis work. So thanks everyone for attending this Design Innovation Month webinar. Also, be sure to check out our website for the schedule of many more upcoming Design Innovation Month webinars. You'll also find a schedule for the SOLIDWORKS 2019 rollout events that are being held in your area throughout the month of October. I hope to see you at one of those live events. Have an awesome remainder of your day. Here's a good question coming your way, Bill. Uh, all right. I have never done dynamic loading simulation before, and this was a great overview, but I need way more time on this topic. Are there self-teaching references to try before a class? Uh, okay. There should be when you're running SOLIDWORKS and you have SOLIDWORKS Simulation Premium, there should be a couple of tutorials built into SOLIDWORKS for dynamic analysis. Another thing that you can do is when you have the simulation add-in loaded, if you use your pull-down menus, do help. Uh, actually, a couple ways to do it. So simulation help topics, 
You could look for NAFEMS benchmarks or also uh, simulation references. I don't remember the exact term without pulling that up. Um, so there are so, some references available there. Outside of that, um, you can also look at the SOLIDWORKS discussion forums where people are asking questions. You might find some information there. You can look at our YouTube channel, uh, CATI's YouTube channel, or CATI's blog site. Um, and outside of that, um, there are other uh, references that you could find, um, for instance, YouTube videos and so forth. So yes, there are a number of different options for learning more about dynamics before you would attend one of our training classes. Well, Bill, that appears to be the last question, so I think we'll wrap things up for the day. Awesome. Chris, thank you very much for your help today, and everyone, uh, I hope you learned something about SOLIDWORKS simulation and dynamic studies. Have a great day. Thank you very much, Bill. That was one of the most informative, <clears throat> excuse me, and easy to understand simulation presentations I think I've ever seen, so really appreciate putting that together uh, for everybody. I think everybody, myself included, definitely learned a lot. So thank Good. you, everybody, Good. for attending, and thank you for putting that together. You're welcome.